this is a really good heave. New Zealand treading water and Ireland are through again. Three Saturdays in a row. Three early tries. Josh van der Fleer is the man who touches it down this time. What a start again. It's incredible. James Lowe. Back in to Hugo Kine. New Zealand 3, Ireland 22. Be numbers out on the far side for New Zealand. Here's Will Jordan about to stamp his arrival in the game at last. Against Sexton and he burns him. Will Jordan and the deficit is down to three points. Good surge from Ireland. Herring. He stretched and he got there. Can you believe? Oh, it's incredible. It's incredible. I didn't think he should have broke off of there. He had a wall of all blacks in front of him. And Peter O'Mahony, who has put his heart and his soul into this tour to New Zealand. They all have. They all have. Conor Murray. Ireland's confidence and a roar as the clock goes red. And Joey Carberry will kick to touch to end the game. I think this is the hardest thing that you can do by a country mile in rugby, especially when you take it down to the last game. And we know that the All Blacks, the history, are, are going to come out firing. And uh, not just to be up so much at half time, but the, the, the most pleasing thing for me by, by a long stretch was the composure when, when they came back at us. Because they always do. They always do. And we never got ahead of ourselves when we was in front. And we never panicked when, when they started to come back. And uh, yeah, well, I mean, I suppose when you when you look at it like that, I suppose it is the most proud that I've ever been of being part of a group, without a shadow of a doubt. Like it doesn't get much better than this. To like to go to go to, uh, and by saying that, it's the, the biggest respect we can give New Zealand. Um, like the celebrations probably weren't, you know, the most humble, but like we that shows how much it means to us to come down here. Um, like we came here with the Lions and we thought it was great to get a draw um, and the guys that felt that we should have won were criticised and um, so to come down here and, and do it uh, it's just very very special um, and it's a special group led by led by Faz of course and, and uh, yeah, it's, it's, it's great to be a part of you'd see you shine you shine there you go, the words of Jonathan Sexton, Andy Farrell and the voices of Conor McNamara and Alan Quinlan calling Ireland's historic 32-22 victory over the All Blacks in Wellington on Saturday morning that culminated in a series victory for Ireland, a first ever on New Zealand soil to pick through the bones of that victory and indeed the series as a whole and what it proffers for the future of Irish rugby specifically the next 12 months I'm delighted to say we're joined by Keith Wood and also by Matt Williams uh, evening gentlemen thank you for so much for joining us this evening uh, Keith I'll turn to you first as someone who's kind of trodden that ground before what did Saturday morning mean to you? Um, it, was, it was funny it was, I was I was quite emotional watching it I was emotional watching the uh, the second test as well and I know that sounds kind of odd but the first test in the manner in which we played which we were inaccurate um, I wasn't emotional at all because that's almost what we expect not that we'd be inaccurate but that we, would, we wouldn't we would win down there and um, we were hoping for the one chance to maybe get a win so then the manner in which uh, Ireland won the second test I think that is all to dream but I was afraid to dream too much you know because your heart gets broken too often uh, but to watch the game and to watch the manner in which um, the team stood up um, the, the manner in which they deconstructed the all black defensive line uh, the level of composure that was shown the um, the attitude and the accuracy for the whole lot so there was a huge amount of preparation that had gone into it but there still see, seems to be a sense of freedom in the manner in how they play and a, a high level of enjoyment and of course they went to the well and they went as deep as they could possibly go. Um, and I know Andy Farrell mentioned it there, but the manner under which after the All Blacks had 
uh, had scored three tries, had come back into it, or two tries, had come back into it, were, were gone very close in, in the in the scoreline. The manner in which Ireland finished out the game was just so unbelievably impressive. And I know people have said, uh, you know, it's it's important and how important a game it is, but it was it's the best concerted performance that I've seen from an Irish rugby team and the best 10 days of rugby that we've seen an Irish team be able to go and deliver. Um, look, I grew up with stories of the Lions of 1971 um, winning, you know, winning that series down there um, um, because there was obviously no way a Northern Hemisphere team could go down there and beat New Zealand on their home turf. Um, I go back to 20 years ago, touring down there, and we didn't even know what questions to ask, no mind of any of the answers. And that's the, the that's what's happened in the last six years, that we've had uh, five wins against the All Blacks. We don't have that monkey on our back. We now have a sense of belief that we're able to beat them, uh, not with impunity, but we can go into every game, not as underdogs, but as, as equals or in the last period of time, better than equals. So I, like, I'm proud because it's a really cool place to be where you can dream the dream and not have your heart broken on a Saturday morning. Would you have been as emotional were you not a player and were, did you not have to go through the things that you went through down there in New Zealand as a player? Yeah, I don't. I don't know. I mean, I I always took it as a. It's a privilege to play any international match. It's it's one of those strange things, and um, I would wear that very comfortably as something that that um, it highlights the amount of hard work that has to go into wearing an Ireland jersey, um, and you want to be able to wear it and win with it. And in our time, we didn't win a huge amount, mm. and um, so when I look at it now and have a sense of pride with it, the sense of pride comes from the fact that we all wanted what they have. There's no bitterness or envy with it. It's just uh, all these things are built on the work of other people and you still require men, uh, 23 men to go out onto a field on a, on a given Saturday and actually do the work to get the win. We now have a, a team that seems to be comfortable doing that a lot of the time it's it's phenomenal I, I like i we've ups and downs all the time and we've peaks and troughs all the time um for for me i i just like the style that ireland play because i think it's sustainable and now we do need all of our players uh, as fit as we can get them and we need a few more players to come through but the, but the style is something that can change often. It isn't set in stone. It isn't um, requiring 10 phases to work for it to actually function. So it seems natural and it seems as if the players have been given the freedom to have a bit of crack on one side, but also have uh, make a mistake. Mm. Be, 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 um, try something, do something. Um, you maybe not be castig castigated for it if it doesn't come off. And like that sort of freedom is fantastic. And there was a couple of comments about there was no, it wasn't a fear of losing or that New, Ze New Zealand had a fear of losing and Ireland didn't. That is an unbelievable mental shift to have a team um, willing to be vulnerable going for a win. That's an extraordinary step that um, I have to say wasn't there in my day. And it's great to see it present in a green jersey. Um, but I do know how hard it is and I know how hard it is to lose. And it's an awful lot easier to win. But the effort that has to go through to win is just of such a high degree. When you looked at the faces of some of the players coming off the field, um, and like, okay, Peter Romani crying, um, uh, which I loved to see, and uh, you know, but that was a, that was a cry maybe for two different reasons: one for the emotion, but also for the pure, unadulterated fatigue that he he felt, as did all the other players in the field. Um, like I know Johnny was thirty-seven during the week, but he aged as that match went on. Sure. He looked about sixty when he came off the field. I mean, he they literally emptied every single bit of the tank. Um, so I think when you're watching those games, you're saying, my God, I have to be proud of those men. Matt, you've obviously dealt with Ireland players uh, on a provincial level in the past in terms of them coming back from tours, uh, be them successful or, or probably in the main, not back in the day. That shift in mentality that Keith speaks about there, that's probably the biggest thing to take away from this is that there's no sense of 
inferiority complex about these players anymore and the ability to go away to places like Australia and places like New Zealand and pick up series wins. Like picking up series wins, like it, it's it's an incredible shift, as Keith mentions there. What did it mean to you looking on on Saturday as, as somebody who's been embedded in Irish rugby for so long? I've got to say, I, it was a bit similar to Keith. I was pretty emotional at about the 76-minute mark. Um, as I did last week in the second test like Keith, I was sitting there watching by myself, talking to myself, which is not a particularly healthy thing <laughs> to do, but just saying, they're going to do it. My God, they're going to do it. They are going to do this. And to win one test was a phenomenal achievement. And obviously winning against the New Zealand Maori during the week, that tour was a great success. Before the ball was kicked off in Wellington, Ireland, that was the most successful tour in Irish rugby history. To win the third test, knowing what New Zealand would do, was immeasurable. Mentally, not physically. So there's a, there's a couple of parts of this. First part is, uh, and, and I'm, I'm sure Woody will back me up, and it's physically many members of Irish teams 20 years ago when I first arrived in Ireland, 22 years ago now, they were not physically fit at, at the top level of, of world conditioning. In other words, there were teams around the world that were fitter than Ireland. We'd see Ireland go toe-to-toe for 60. They couldn't do it in the last 20. Now, every one of those players is magnificently physically conditioned. And the provinces deserve huge credit for that, as does Jason Cowman, the head of, of the uh, strength and conditioning program for the IRFU. But mentally, it was a, it's the, this is the biggest thing about it. And what used to really bug me about being in Ireland, saying, oh, we've got to be underdogs. We can only play well for underdogs. I think that comes from, like, Jack Charlton in those days at the with a football team. And instead of just saying, well, look at yourselves, guys. You are equal to any athletes in the world. And I've been... Woody's heard me say this for many years. I've been saying this since I got there. I was astounded at the calibre of athlete that I was confronted with when I went into Leinster and obviously that great Munster side that Cooper's part. I was astounded at the, at the athlete. But I was also astounded at the lack of self-belief from those same physically great players. Andy Farrell deserves... Massive credit because ultimately test match rugby at the very top level is a mental game. And if ever we needed proof in that, there there it is in this three test series. Mentally, Ireland weren't at the races in the first test and New Zealand were quite magnificent at Eden Park. And then what changed physically? Not at all. All that changed was the mental approach of the players. And the, at the top end of all sport, as we watched the, the, the British Open yesterday and the, and the Australian with the mullet just mentally come through at the end, it's the same in all sport. But Ireland have never been able to conquer that in rugby at the elite end. And Keith, that, that dragon is well and truly slayed now. Yeah. That dragon is yeah. gone. Keith, that issue of, of ditching that notion of, of underdogs and having to kind of fight from the bottom and, and scrap for everything, like we'd have every advantage uh, to ourselves in terms of the provincial setup and how players are able to prepare physically as, as Maddie mentions there like they're, they can't be regarded as being any better athletes in the country at the moment so shedding that sense of inferiority complex and gosh gee whiz like we're only little old Ireland we don't need that anymore and that, that seemed to be the final kind of shedding of all those elements down in, in Wellington on, on Saturday morning Yeah I, I, th- I think there are elements of that and look I would have said back 20 years, 30 years when I started, um, the there were always players who, who, who believed that to be the case. Um, um, but as, as uh, Matty alluded to, our fitness definitely wasn't right in the 90s. Um, um, we didn't also have a defensive structure when other teams did and we got burnt out actually at the end of the 90s. In the start of the 2000s, we were burnt out in the last 15 minutes because we were covering each other's back all the time. Um, so the structures that have been put in, like I was trying to look at this and a lot of things have been built on top of coaches. So Gatlin came in at a consistency of selection, a f- fairly forward and uh, 10 kicking game. It then moved on to Eddie O'Sullivan 
uh, and he had a far more backs oriented game and he was successful with triple crowns which was good it was a good stepping stone then kidney with um, a less technical coaching style but they won a grand slam which was pretty impressive then we moved on to to joe schmidt joe incredibly technical incredible exactitude for every single thing that had to happen incredibly detailed um, and that level of detail broke the broke the back of maybe some of the doubt within the Irish camp, within the doubt within the uh, the minds of some of the players and the supporters, so that there was things were very possible if you were able to do all these things. Um, and I remember once having a conversation with Brian O'Driscoll about Joe Schmidt, and he said, Woody, we'll never have a better coach. And I said, well, you're saying that because you're he was young at the time. Mm-hmm. And I said, you're young because you haven't had other coaches yet. And each coach brings something else and something different. And what Farrell seems to have brought is he has used the exactitude that Joe Schmidt had, but he has um, he's loosened the, the reins a little bit. He has brought in some of that exactitude in Paul O'Connell and his attention to detail in the forward, so that has helped. Um, but he's given them leeway to be themselves and to be able to see what's in front of them. He's also given them a structure that protects the 10, um, it's given them a structure where um, a, a really good footballer in the pivot can make a decision um, and there may be four or five decisions to make and he can make the one where there's the gap. That's a pretty cool place to be. It means everybody has to be in the right place. But other than that, you're talking decision makers all the time. And we keep talking about leadership that's required for sport and the idea of professional sport kind of you know, it, it it rounds the edges of leadership. It kind of knocks them all off because this is what we all do. We all do it together. Well, it's very hard to make an independent call. Um, it looks for me as if Farrell has brought that back into focus, that actually enough of players are able to make the calls themselves and they're flourishing in that as an idea. So um, for me, it's the chip on the shoulder. These are all players that are comfortable in the system. Now, they're comfortable in the system and they're going to be able to play within that system. And if that system works, then they have the belief to do pretty much anything. Now, we also know that the teams have watched this. We've come to number one in in the world. Um, How are people going to dismantle what we do? So the great part of the last few weeks is we were poor in in the first test. Now, I've heard them say they weren't that poor, but they were poor enough by comparison Mm. in the first test and the change that was made, the accuracy that was improved on, the attention to detail that was improved on between the first and second test was very stark. And Ireland are going to have to be able to make changes and subtle changes all the way because this can't be static now. Um, but I feel as if we have a structure that's able to evolve. That's that's a really interesting place to be. You know, you have to have the players that are able to buy into that. And I think we have. So... Um, it's this is something that isn't static anymore. So for for me, any player that comes into this side has to have the belief that they can go and beat whoever is against them, and that definitely wasn't the case in the past. Yeah, you, there's that quote doing rounds today. I saw in Keen Tracy's piece in the Indo where he was talking Matt about how before the series began, when when the team and the forty man squad first gathered, uh, Andy Farrell sat them all down and asked them, "Do you believe we can win a series?" in New Zealand never mind winning one test you believe we can win a series and they all had to be on board with that but when we talk about the mental strength between Eden Park and Dunedin I get the sense that that mental strength was kind of born maybe even well long before that but certainly in and around that time when Farrell had just uh, you know he'd gotten his feet under the table a little bit but there was that wobbly start to the 2021 Six Nations with back to back defeats and there was major questions about his future but it seems as if there was enough surety in his head about where he wanted Ireland to be and his belief in the players transmitted well enough to the players that they managed to dig themselves out of that hole and was, you know, the birth of that self-belief that got them from the first test to the second during the last couple of weeks. There was somewhere in the summer of 21 where Andy Farrell must have looked in the mirror and thought, unless I do something pretty drastic here, I'm out the door. I believe he was out the door because... If we go back to, to the, the great Irish victory against New Zealand at the Abuja in November, 19, uh, November 18, exactly what Woody has just said didn't occur. That team didn't evolve. 
And 2019, leading up to the World Cup, was a disastrous year. Farrell took over after that World Cup and was a disciple of Joe Schmidt and tried to claim what Joe had done. And Joe's a great coach. I'm not trying to talk Joe down. I'm just trying to say what I see. And for the next 12 months, Ireland didn't progress. And Farrell was not showing, in my opinion, the leadership qualities and the, the strategic qualities that a head coach, a successful head coach at international level needs to go with the talent at his disposal. He had a talented team. In that summer, he changed. And they adopted a, a ground up philosophy and that was based on how Leinster were playing and he changed his selection policy to have Leinster players in it and his structure that Keith has spoken about so correctly was basically not the same but almost a Leinster structure that empowered decision makers within that structure to make good decisions including the forwards taking the ball forward how often we seen for our Irish forward taking forward and just tipping inside or outside leading to a break they can make those decisions and that has struck a chord with the players. And the players believe in the system, they believe in the coach, and that started in November 21 and extended right through. And apart from an hour against France and the first test in Auckland, the system that Farrell's put in place has grown and has been very, very effective. It's not going to, there's no guarantees every week in rugby are going to win and there's no guarantees that this great performance is going to deliver a great performance in the World Cup. That's not how rugby works. But Farrell has grown and shown that he can lead. He's got a great plan. He's hired great people around him like Paul. And Paul has done a phenomenal job. And that has, has been part uh, handed off onto the players, who he's also empowered after he's educated and aligned them. And this is the, the creation of what can occur. Now, if you look back at history, <clears throat> the last trip to do this was the Wallabies in 1986. It's my generation of players. Two of my club mates were in that team, Steve Tymon and Brett Patworth. They then didn't evolve, went out the next year in the World Cup, were completely up themselves, didn't believe, didn't think they had to change, and they got bundled out in one of the greatest games of all time by France in the semifinals. Mm. So the evolution and the change that Woody spoke about, to me, that's crucial. I heard Muppets start telling me, oh, they peaked a year too early. I've never heard such rubbish in my life. I know, it's just garbage. Like We're not an Olympic sport. We don't try and peak every four years. It just doesn't happen. That's not how it works. But this Irish team is in a great place. If they've got the right attitude and all the, um, all the things we're seeing from them is they have a great attitude for all the things Keith has just said and you, and, and, and you just said there, Richie. Mm. Their attitude is we've got to get better. And that puts us in great stead for the next 12 months. There might be ups and downs the next 12 months, but you've got South Africa, Australia... England and France at home before you get to the World Cup trials. France, to me, are the outstanding team in that group. Having them at home and to try and get some psychological uh, uh, advantage over them will be absolutely important, as will the Springboks. Wallabies aren't there yet. I think Ireland will deal with the Wallabies pretty, pretty not easily, but I, I, I expect they'll win. Mm. But with all those things that Farrell's put in place and the right attitude and that playing program, I think there is there is real hope for the next fifteen months. Keith, like as, as Matt alluded to there, like we've been here before, not necessarily obviously winning series in New Zealand, but in terms of putting in excellent performances a year out from a World Cup, and there has been that sense of trepidation. But one of the refrains that we've heard since Saturday morning has been, "This feels different to where we were in 2018, to where we were in 2014. This feels like there is." enough of an ability to pivot and enough of an ability to change within a game that we can actually go out and beat teams in a year's time in a World Cup. Now, granted, the environment is going to be you know, very, very different. You're talking about multiple games coming at you pretty quick. But do you share that sense, along with Matt, that, that this does feel different to a year out from previous World Cups? Uh, I think some parts of it feel different. You know, we're seeing feeling from 12,000 miles away, really, from, from the players playing. But... Um, <laughs> There, there is, there's, there was something I wanted to talk on, uh, just, to, just to, to maybe highlight that part. And I think Matty talked on it a little bit. The, the sort of Andy Farrell's EQ, his emotional intelligence, his ability to make the team have that sense of team. Um, he immediately said, it's "The players did the hard work on the field." You know, he kind of puts the places, the pieces in play. 
it didn't feel like false modesty. Modesty, it just felt like that's the way he wanted to have it, that that's the, what it actually was. It's like a kind of pure rugby guy. Um, I know he's rugby league, but rugby. Um, but his sense of what the team means and what they have to go through together, and it seems to be together, there isn't a, a them and us. For me, that seems the difference. Um, for the last 18 months, I've been hearing, and I think I, I concur with um, uh, with Matty's comments about Joe Schmidt. Joe did an extraordinary job, but it was an incredibly prescribed job, and that's tiring after a period of time. Um, this team, the difference for this is the players seem to be enjoying the crack, looking forward to going into camp, looking forward to the freedom that they're getting. They're, they're allowed to be adults and children maybe, you know, and they're allowed to have a bit of fun. Um, so for me, that seems a little bit different. I think we still have um, too much reliance on a couple of players. Um, and that for me would be on part of the risk register that you do up for the next 12 or 14 months. These are things that need to be solved. And I think we've taken a couple of steps towards it, but we are shallow in a few spots. But before, if you were on, it's funny, actually, I met somebody in the street and said, well, when you're first in the world, the only place you can go is go down. <laughs> and I said, are you not allowing us to have one day of enjoyment for this rather than taking out the bloody bleak cloud? Um, I think we should try and embrace this as much as we can. It's an notional idea. That's what it is. And it's entirely notional until the World Cup gets gets played and we see where we are at that moment in time. Um, but I do think what what the last 10 days has shown us, or, or 14 days, it's the art of the possible. So we shouldn't fear anyone, and we shouldn't fear ourselves either, because our, ourselves being the not great performance in the first match, we shouldn't fear that we're able to turn that around. Um, and that's one of the things I really liked was the structure of this tour was so bloody awkward, horrible, and hard that um, it mirrors what a World Cup is like. Mm. So, um, yeah, I take an awful lot from it. And I do think a lot is different because of that. Does it annoy you when, like what Matt alluded to there, with people saying that we've we've peaked too early, we've been here before, and similarly people trying to underplay, you know, the sense of, 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 of winning matches. Maybe people who aren't necessarily rugby fans, but there's a sense among Try a certain you. cohort of people that they yeah. don't want to give this its due. You know, that kind it, of drives, it, drives me, it drives me absolutely mad. I've heard pe people saying that they're only friendly matches, which just gives a, a fairly high lack of understanding of what touring and rugby has been and what it has been for over 100 years. Um, uh, the magnitude of what's been done is pretty extraordinary, like truly extraordinary. And it is for a moment in time. And... Uh, my sons were 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 asking me at, at the final whistle as to you know why was I is so excited. I said because it's history, and watching history unfold in front of you is pretty phenomenal, especially when it's going your way. And um, so I think the players have to park. They have to enjoy it. Of course they do. They have to enjoy it. They have to enjoy it out there. They have to enjoy it when they come home. They have to have a proper break when they come back in again. It has put a huge target on their back and I would hope that this particular group will relish the target and say, that's fine. We've put our, our hands up. We've done what we wanted to do. Like, what was the alternative to not play as well as they can play and lose it so that they wouldn't do it, you know, so that they wouldn't peak within World Cups? Well, who's to say it's the peak? We just know it's the highest level that we're at at the moment. But who's to say that that's the, the Everest of this group? So... Um, I just think it leads open to to a fantastic 12 months ahead, definitely with expectation. But as Matt said, again, and it's nice to kind of hear it coming from, from another perspective, there's still going to be an expectation of ups and downs because rugby is awkward. Difficult game can uh, hinge entirely on a referee's interpretation. Um, and I think we were lucky with the interpretation at the weekend. I thought it was a red card for for, for Andrew Porter. But um, the uh, anything can happen at any stage. So we do know that in our lifetime, we've seen Ireland go and 
beat New Zealand on home turf and win a series over there. And that's something to just have joy over, mm-hmm. you know, and uh, the naysayers can say whatever they like, but I do think you want to be able to celebrate when, when we do things well. And this is an achievement um, beyond anything else that Ireland have done in rugby. Matt, on Keith's point there about Ireland, depending on one or two players, uh, probably a little bit too much at the moment. Um, would you share that concern from Keith's point of view? And also, I guess like Andy Farrell's done a really good job of blooding players over the last while. Like if you look at, ja- uh, sorry, Caelan Doris and uh, Hugo Keenan, Jameson Gibson Park, they're all in around the 20 cap mark. And those 20 odd caps have all come under Farrell in these last two and a bit years. So it shows that, you know, and even throw in Dan Sheen and Mac Hansen, they're playing international rugby for less than a year. So there is scope you would think, to broaden out his pool a little bit in those areas that maybe, to Keith's point, are a little bit concerning in terms of their lack of depth. It, it is, and um, the, the most successful uh, coach at a World Cup is Ed Jones. Um, you know, he's made the semi-finals and finals multiple occasions. His assistant coach, he's won it. He's made two finals as a head coach and lost it. He has a number. He says every player in your squad at a World Cup must be at or around 20 caps. That's the minimum. He prefers them at 30. So Farrell has done a very good job with that. I, I, I'm not putting words in the Keith's mind, uh, mouth, but to me, um, Sexton is a huge problem. Not because he is a problem. He probably played two of the best games I've ever seen him play in the last two, four, uh, last seven months. He was, he was mind-bogglingly good. Now, you've got to thank his forwards. His forward laid down the foundation. Whenever you're 9 and 10 play well, thank you, thank the 1 to 8 because they lay the foundation down for you for that. But in chasing this win of this cup, of this series, we haven't really blooded Joey in a big test. Is Joey the answer? Some of us are believing not. If we spin back to the Australian series in 2018, Ireland came out, played Joey the first test, then we said, we're going to win this series, we're going to change it all. And beat Australia in Australia, first time since Kieran Fitzgerald's team in 79. Did that really change it? Was that really worth it? So th- there are still problems for this team to work out. And there's going to have to be sacrifices in selection as we go through this next 15 months to give people time and to rest our true great players. Mm. Uh, and, and that probably is will, will Connor Murray make it. Peter Armani was amazing on this tour. I thought Peter was finished two years ago. So so I wanted to see a backup for Peter, and I wanted to see a backup for Connor Murray, and I want to see a backup for uh, Johnny starting and, and in Connor's place on the bench. Now, they made a call. We are going to win the series in New Zealand. Was that the right call? Absolutely. This is without doubt the greatest performance by any Irish sporting team in history, in my opinion. This is greater than Jackie Kyle's team, greater than any, any football team in the World Cup. What they did, Woody knows, this is one of, if not the hardest achievement in team sports in the world. And over 100 years, only three teams have done it. And Ireland click into Go down there and win a season. South Africa in the 50s, Wallabies in the 86, and now, and now the Ireland. I mean, extraordinary, off the scale. So the benefits the team will get in self-belief from that win outweigh um, blooding the other players and losing the third team, for sure. But somewhere, we've got a plan, you know, plan for the worst, hope for the best. What happens if Johnny gets a dead leg in the week before a semi-final? Pulls a hamstring. We've got to have number two with time. Not time against Italy, not, not time against Georgia. It's got to be starting really big gun and, and Joey needs more of those if Joey is the answer and we also need the backup to uh, Jamison Gibson Park to be given time besides Connor Connor's got so many caps we know he's a great player not talking Connor down but we need to find out if Ray Casey is the man to take that on so yes there are some questions the big plus that, that outweighs all those when New Zealand come back I'd watched Australia a hundred times over the last two decades. Lead New Zealand, you think today's the day we're going to do it. We're up by 10, we're up by 15, and New Zealand find a way in those last seconds to beat you to come back. And I just saw those tries, and I'm thinking, here we go. Todd Byrne did two amazing things, a counter-ruck and a steal. 
and they showed immense strength beyond what I thought Ireland could have, and they scored that try, Hemmings scored that try up the other end of the field. Mm. Um, that was extraordinary. Keith, just on those areas of concern that you raised there, because I think we're having a bit of problems with Matt's line in terms of connection strength, um, Jonathan Sexton is the one. That kind of, when you see the state in which he leave the, left the pitch on Saturday, you kind of look at it and go, he's 37, going to be rolling into 38 next summer. You're going to amplify what we saw at the end of the game by you know a couple of uh, degrees come next year. Uh, if Joey Carberry isn't the guy... Uh, is it okay that you know Kieran Frawley's gotten those backup games against the Maori and, and were you impressed by what you saw from him and his potential ability to step in at ten? Should that be required of him in a year's time? Yeah, I mean, look, I look, I thought it's funny. Uh, Peter Mahoney, um, uh, Matty thought Peter Mahoney was finished two years ago. I thought he wasn't enjoying rugby two years ago. Um, uh, Johnny Sneck, uh, Sexton, who we've we've always been talking about, has been kind of snarly. Um, was particularly snarly two years ago. He was getting smashed left, right and centre. He then had started drifting very deep. Um, and I thought he was finished two years ago. Um, that's what we're talking about in terms of the uh, emotional intelligence of um, Andy Farrell and his coaching capabilities is to structure a game that gets the best out of unbelievable stalwarts for, for Ireland. Um I'd no worry with Johnny being wrecked looking at the end of the game the other day. What he just put in was was phenomenal. You know, you have to you have to give him every single ounce of credit he deserves because he was he was he played a brilliant game. Um he orchestrated everything. Um for me, I'd like to see Joey play with more confidence and play more rugby and get a good injury free run. Um, uh, look, I, I know I'm like a broken record with this, but I think a lot of the Munster players had lost some of their confidence. Um, they were playing a game that didn't suit them, that wasn't uh, in any way flowing. And I'm not saying passing to the winds, but um, everything was about slowing Munster down. And that hasn't been their way for for a long while. So I don't think that that suited them. So I think they'd lost a bit of the joy of it. Um, Joey needs to be... Um, integrated into the system more because he he still seems to play like a maverick of which he is more gifted um, than any of the other players in terms of that but there isn't that space and we do need him to play to the system Um, for me Kieran Frawley looks like he could fit into that system tomorrow morning Um, so are the questions that are going to be asked by David Nusifora and the IRFU what exactly are the provinces going to do for some of these players? Are they going to help make certain that we have the players that we need to, to get the exposure uh, to play in big club matches and big European matches so that we are fully primed by the time it comes to the World Cup? That's a really interesting element. I don't know if they have that that power to do that or whether they should or shouldn't. Um, but uh, yeah, I was impressed with Frawley. I thought he was okay in the first game, though a lot of people seemed to pan him and I couldn't understand that. And I thought he played particularly well in the second game. For a guy who's played little to no rugby at out half, um, I thought he showed an aptitude to it and uh, he has the work ethic anyway. So um, I look, I was more comfortable with that. He's more robust um, than either of the other tens, uh, than but both the other tens. So, yeah, I'd, I'd be happy with that. For the other strength and depth, we need more work behind Tyg Furlong. He put in an unbelievable shift and he's another guy who looked ancient coming off the field. Um, I do think that and I mentioned this the other day, that Peter O'Mahony puts in shifts like that. His body is crying out. You can see it's crying out. How long is he going to be able to do that? Do we have somebody else who can do that type of role? And I think we do. So I think Ty Byrne can move into that sixth position. And I think that load can be shared over the next 12 months. And I think we might get the most out of both of them because Ty Byrne, having not played for four or five months and being poor in the first test which he was was phenomenal for the last two tests so um, I do think there's a a bit of swapping and uh, changing of players and positions um, and I think we can maximise what we have but we could do with more game time for young tight heads and um, we need to see more of the other players because 
uh, if Tiger were to get injured, I think we'd be a bit vulnerable. It's similarly to, like, I know people wanted to see uh, players blooded on these series and on these tours. Um, Andy Farrell obviously placed the emphasis on winning the tournament. He did it similar in the Six Nations last year where he said, listen, the Six Nations is a competition, we want to win it. Uh, you can't just go out throwing players out there willy-nilly. But there is a case, Matt, that for this Six Nations upcoming, the one literally just prior to the World Cup, that you do have to expand your player pool a little bit in the sense that you don't drop in players out of nowhere, but you maybe push forward those ones that have been on the fringe and have been crying out for international game time in the Six Nations because, you know, we're going to play it again next year. We're going to be playing these teams again in 12 months' time. We're not going to have a World Cup in 12 months' time. We better get these players up to speed. Is the Six Nations the right environment to do that or do you wait again until this upcoming autumn or do you wait again until those warm-up games or do you just say, screw it, let's let's, let's give them a run in the Six Nations? Oh, look, I'm a great believer that you've got to you got to give guys the opportunity in that environment. So it's it's not just the game. It's the build-up in the week. It's the press. It's the pressure, the, the emotional state that people have to deal with in the lead-up to the game, not just on match day but that whole week. And the more you do it, the more comfortable you are with it, the more you, you realise how to manage yourself. And everyone has a different way of managing their week. But to throw a... And this is... If we think back to Ian Madigan when Keith and I were working together at 2015 World Cup. Gee, Woody, where's that time gone? But it's, it, you know, Madigan was thrown in. And that, uh, I believe it was against Argentina and the, and the other test was against France there leading up. But he should have been given many more opportunities leading up to that. Now, if we say let's choose maybe a Wales game at home, Scotland at home, and you don't bring in 10 guys because that's failure. Mm. But two or three guys in out of each 23, given strategic selections and strategic time on the field and resting our great players that we hope will last to the next World Cup, you know, 10 months further down the track, I think is, is highly achievable without giving away or throwing away a performance, without sacrificing a home win against one of the Celt sides. Now, I'm not suggesting you go against England, you want to put out your best side and beat them. You go against France, you want to put out your best side. But we have to take some strategic risks, not great risks where we're going to let everyone fail, but some strategic risks in key positions. Exactly what Keith said at tight head. What happens if Tyke Burlong, the week before the quarterfinal, gets ill, mm-hmm. gets a small injury? What do we do? Now, if we, we've got a plan for that. And if you don't do it as a coach, that's really bad planning. And you have to be prepared to take strategic risks in doing that. So my answer to that is yes. Other people keep saying, no, it's a six nation, we've got to win it. But that's what Ireland have always done. And Ireland have lost nine quarterfinals in the World Cup in a row. Here we are talking about this great performance in New Zealand. Every single decision in Irish rugby over the next 15 months has one purpose in my eyes. That's a performance at the World Cup. I'm not demeaning the Six Nations. The Six Nations is part of that process and we should try and win it. But we also should be winning that Six... aiming to win that Six Nations as a solid preparation for the World Cup. As as Clive Woodward did in 2003, as other teams have, have done in the past. And the French have been very good at this. They've made finals without winning it. And the French are going to use this Six Nations as part of their planning process and preparation process for their World Cup. Mm-hmm. And we have to do the same because we are, we are a, Ireland are a contender and we have to live with that, that reality. Uh, Keith, I want to take you back to something you mentioned earlier on about the importance of a series and the, uh, the, the aura of a series win. Jonathan Sexton, in his, pretty much his closing comment, I think, in his post-match press conference alongside Andy Farrell, alluded to the fact that the notion of these series heading down uh, to the Southern Hemisphere in the summer is in danger of being killed by these World Rugby plans to you know, incorporate this new World Rugby series whereby everybody's going to be jetting around the world and playing each other once during the course of a, a, you know, an international break, etc., etc. Do you think that's a damaging thing that we're going to be in danger of losing these series? I think the last week, not only with ourselves, you look at the, the series involving the Springboks and the Wallabies over the course of the last week or so, all of them went down to a deciding test. Like there's worth here and getting rid of these things seems to be 
a very unpopular decision. It would be unpopular, I'd imagine, with the rugby going public in the Southern Hemisphere, and it would be an unpopular decision, it seems at least, with the players who are the you know the key thing to all this is the people who want to play these matches. It seems like a mad thing to to throw yeah. this all away. It was interesting, Richie. Um, um, Matt mentioned that rugby doesn't um, peak every four years like the Olympics. Um, at the present moment in time, like this present tour of or this present group of players, some of them have been playing for twelve months. That's not sustainable in any way, shape, or form. Mm. An off season is desperately needed um, for these players. Lions tours are phenomenal for their difficulty, but also as commerciality and it tidies up a huge amount of issues for the finances for the southern hemisphere and um, there are so many reasons why a Lions tour needs to go ahead the world cup is incredibly um important because it's been set as as the gold standard every four years and that's fantastic but at the present moment in time everybody's fighting for um the same pie and they're just slicing it into smaller slices all the time. And each slice is an extra match or an extra two matches. Um, so I have an objection myself to a huge amount of the travel that's going on. Um, I wasn't a fan for, of the South African teams joining the URC. I just d- didn't think that that made sense. It made some commercial sense. But we are looking at players that are... The amount of injuries we've had on all these matches has been pretty stark as well. Um, the amount of concussions that are happening are incredibly upsetting. Um, I would r- far rather World Rugby looked at uh, trying to enhance the game more rather than enhance it by more games, if that makes sense. And uh, I think we have something that's pretty strong, pretty robust uh, competitions, um, but we're tinkering with them and have been tinkering with them since the start of professionalism. Um, you look to try and build up a sense of loyalty and rivalry and different issues with it, but we already have a huge amount of those set, but we chip away at them all the time to try and make them a bit better, make a little bit more money, um, you know, incorporate more people all the time. And I think we are at a little bit of risk with the game, with trying to fill more matches in. Um, The international game produces the most money, um, but the, the game and the grassroots part are all followed from schools to then um, to the provincial teams playing or the club teams playing. That's the lifeblood of it. If you keep trying to pull all the players away and the best players away from it, it becomes much harder for that part of the game to grow. And um, it is one of the, the knock-on consequences of professionalism is that squads are getting bigger and bigger and bigger, which require more money, more money, more money, which requires more matches to to generate that money. And I think uh, pressing pause wouldn't do any harm whatsoever to try and tidy up the season a little bit more, to get rid of the elongated nature of it, to give a proper break at the end of the season. If we look at American football, it's 16 weeks for the regular season, mm. plus another four weeks. We're in week 51, I think it is, in this season. So that just shows you the level of disconnect between the idea of what professional sport is. Matt, we're just about out of time, but I'd imagine you probably echo uh, Woody's sentiments to a degree there that, you know, the status quo necessarily isn't worth protecting, but you've got to be, you know, careful about what you're dis- discarding. I, absolutely. You have to be very careful. Very, we have to be very careful what we do with the game because there's a lot of uh, risk with the game at the present moment in time and we still haven't quite got our, our head around that and excuse the pun. Um, but the idea of playing more matches on after long flights doesn't necessarily point the way towards player welfare. Mm. Matty? Yeah, look, I, I, I think we should start at the point that uh, rugby league in Australia... Is that which is the, is the most similar professional sport where players have five to six weeks holiday break, then they have somewhere around 12 weeks preparation, and you fit your season in around that. So, therefore, you're putting player welfare recovery and, and physical preparation for a season as your number one building block, and then you build your season around that time frame. 
Um, it's crazy what we're doing to our players now. Like as could, it, you know, let's let's just consider the French team. Uh, they they finished a week before in Japan. Now now if they didn't take their top team. They took basically their second team to Japan. And uh, the first game of the top fourteen is on September four. So most of those top top fourteen teams are back training now, and they'll have a, a one or two trial games and start again. I mean it's just it's just crazy for everyone, for staff mm. and players, for everyone involved. It's just I just shake my head at the stupidity of it, but it is driven by money not by sports science and not by the the, the, the uh, welfare of the players. And that's where we have to start. And we've lost that. I totally agree with you. And I think if you went to a whole lot of guys, I'm a bit older than Keith, but the ex-players who had some form in time in, in amateurism and the beginning of professionalism, I think every one of us would be saying something very similar about the welfare of the players. Yeah, and all rugby and off the ball is with Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us. Uh, Matt and Keith, thank you so much for all of your time this evening. It's been an absolute pleasure. Cheers, James. Thank you. Monday Night Rugby on Off the Ball. With Vodafone, main sponsor of the Irish rugby team. We all belong to the team of us.